Shabbat Shalom. Today, I'm going to explore one of the biggest, most important topics in all of Scripture, possibly in all of life. Because I want to stay within 15 to 20 minutes, I'll start my counter right here, it will be more specific, or I will be more specific and laser focused than I usually am. We will look into the nature of God. Yes, that's like the mother of all topics. But again, I want to be laser focused today. So we're going to boil it down to specifics. So today we will explore the distinction between God the Father and God the Son. But even more specific than that, we will explore the question, is it important that Jesus Christ, God the Son, is not the Father? The quick answer is yes. I can just stop it here and just say, okay, that's all. Took less than a minute. But as you know, we need to prove all things as Scripture admonishes us. And we have to use the Scriptures and not only just use them, but use them in the correct way. So today I will present to you three reasons why it is important that Jesus Christ is not the Father. Reason one, the unity of Scripture. We believe that the Word of God does not contradict itself. However, when we read statements such as Christ being called the Everlasting Father, uh, people who are both in the faith and not in the faith can use scriptures like that to prove a doctrine that is not based on scriptures, that is not scripturally sound. And that can be very destructive, to say the least. Specifically, it is both destructive and dangerous because it calls into question the integrity and the validity, the truthfulness, essentially, of the Holy Scriptures. That includes the five books of Moses, the writings, the prophets, the Gospels, and Paul's epistles, and so on. They're not only called into question, but they are discredited, and they're shown to be contradictory. Now, the good news is, no pun intended, is that this confusion is easily cleared up simply by using the Septuagint translation. So the primary scripture, in my opinion, that is misused when it comes to the belief, the belief regarding Jesus and the Father being one and the same, and they are not, it is the verse found in Isaiah chapter 9 regarding unto us a son is given. So this scripture is being isolated and used to mislead others into believing a lie. And that lie is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not the Son of God, but he's actually God the Father. So let's read that verse in question. That's Isaiah 9, verse 6. First in the Masoretic. The first half is the same in both the Masoretic and the Septuagint. It reads like this. For a child is born to us, and a son is given to us, whose government is upon his shoulder. Now our focus for this first point is the second half of the verse, which reads in the Masoretic, And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty El, or God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So that same portion, the Septuagint, sounds like this. And his name is called the Messenger of Great Counsel. Full stop. There's no other name given. For I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. So we can see that the words Everlasting Father were in fact added to the Masoretic text, which underwent many edits from its inception in the 6th century A.D., Notice A.D., 600 years after the death of Jesus and resurrection, until its final form in the 10th century. So this is at least a millennium after the Septuagint, which dates around 250 years before Christ, and is roughly a millennium 
after the first coming of Jesus Christ. There is zero evidence for the inclusion of the terms everlasting and father in the Septuagint, which is the text that not only predates the first coming of Christ, as I mentioned, but existed in his day. The Septuagint existed in his day and it was used by Jesus Christ and his disciples and the Apostle Paul and the rest of the New Testament church. So in place of this confusing addition of the everlasting father, we instead are provided greater clarity as to, as to the identity of the Messiah, that he was, in fact, the messenger of great counsel. Malachi 3 verse 1 further supports this, uh, this verse in Isaiah. It says here, Behold, I sent forth, what? My messenger. I believe this is speaking of John the Baptist. And he shall survey the way before me. And Adonai, or yod heh vav -Heh, whom you seek, shall suddenly come into his temple. And it, it, it identifies who this is. It says here, even the angel or messenger of the covenant. So there's a messenger preparing the way before the messenger whom you take pleasure in. Behold, he is coming, says Adonai or yod heh vav -Heh Almighty. So another way of expressing this term of uh, messenger is somebody who is not speaking their own words. And they are relaying, as Isaiah said, uh, the messenger of great counsel, he is relaying the great counsel. Another word, for great is good, and a synonym for counsel is news. So the messenger of the good news or the gospel. Uh, Luke 4, 43 just illuminates this fact more than I ever could. So uh, you know what? Let us, ex let us let the Bible expound itself. And I did not have that ready, so please uh, forgive me for that. Let me just look it up in real time here. So this is Luke 4, verses 40 to 43. So beginning in verse 40, it says, Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, Jesus. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. So even the, the, the devils <laughs> say he's the Son of God, not the Father. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ, or Messiah. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place, or a lonely place. And the people sought him, and came unto him, and stayed him, and that he should not depart from them. And here's the crux of the what we're looking at. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore, for this reason, I am I sent. So that's the reason that he says he was sent. So he was sent. The messenger is sent. And what was he to preach? The kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, there are other scriptures that are being used, not just Isaiah 9, verse 6, about the everlasting father, uh, such as, pardon, let me just put that on silent. Such as where Philip asks Jesus in John 14 to show him and the other disciples the Father. Show me the Father. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to offer a quick answer. So this is not going to be so in-depth. I'm just going to be just uh, scratching the surface. So Jesus Christ replied to Philip, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Again, for the sake of, brev of brevity, I will simply counter the use of that scripture, the wrongful use of that scripture, saying Jesus, Jesus is the Father, with John 14, verses 28 to 31. Again, I did not prepare that either, so forgive me again. So John 14. Um, this is the NIV. I don't like the NIV, but I'm just using that because it's the first one that came up. It says here, uh, You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. 
If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going, where? To the Father. Otherwise, you would just say, I'm going to myself. For the Father is, what? The same as me? No, is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Okay. So there are two problems that are presented to those who believe that Jesus is the Father. Just in this one section of John 14, Jesus saying the Father is greater than he is, number one, showing there is an order of authority or perhaps subservience of the Son to the Father. If not authority, then the subservience. Secondly, there is the fact that it was the Father who commanded the Son to carry out his earthly mission. It was not Christ doing this independently. He was sent as a messenger with words that were not his own, but were those of the sender, who is the Father, God the Father. Reason two, the unity of God is misunderstood by most. So on top of the verse in Isaiah 9 and the bad mistranslation of the Masoretic of inserting the terms everlasting father, there is additional confusion when, when people under sorry, when people misunderstand the meaning of the Shema, where it says, Hero Israel, Adonai or Elohim is one Adonai, or the Lord our God is one Lord. So both the Jews and Muslims believe this word one to mean singular, counting one, you know, in terms of numerology. Whereas scripture in many places provides the correct understanding of what this means. So this word one in Hebrew is, as you, you already know, but just in case you didn't, echad. And in the context of the Shema here, God is one, God being echad, it can mean first and can mean united. So this is proven, uh, the first meaning, meaning first, by the first of the Ten Commandments. No pun intended. You shall have no other gods before me. Also, Matthew 22, uh, verses 36 to 40. I didn't have that one queued up either, so I apologize for that. Cutting into my time. But uh, Matthew 22, right. Verses 36 to 40. Okay, it's just loading up. Uh, so this is Christ talking, answering to the young man, asking him, what is the greatest commandment? What's the first and greatest commandment, essentially, in the Torah? Uh, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Okay, uh, I'm just going to stop there. So that is the first. That's our first priority. And again, that lines up with God being first, first priority. Now, explaining the other connotation of echad, which is united, uh, this can be... Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that not only is God our first priority, but he is our first priority in our existence now, today, and forever. Okay, so regarding united, uh, the, the meaning is best expressed in Adam's statement in Genesis 2, where he describes uh, Eve uh, as, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and so on. And he said, therefore, a man shall, uh... okay, you know what? I don't want to go from memory. Let me just read it for you. It says here, if I can zoom in here. Okay, it's not letting me. <laughs> Sorry. This is really problematic. Okay, 23. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of her husband. This is where we're focusing on. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they two, number two, two people, shall be one flesh. Did they literally mold themselves into one being? No. 
they are united. They are united. So that is uh, the explanation about oneness. So that is hopefully clears the confusion for that. So that's reason two. Reason three, there must be a mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ fulfills the greater spiritual law of needing a high priest as intercessor. The Torah requires that. Why was it important for there to be a mediator? Because sin separates man from God. The only bridge, the only way back is through the blood of sacrifice. In this case, it's Christ's sacrifice, his ultimate sacrifice being the the greatest sacrifice reconciles us with the Father. It's Jesus Christ who does that. The relationship between man, sin, the blood sacrifice, and God requires an intercessor. We need someone to advocate for us. Using the court analogy, uh, we need a lawyer for us to defend us as we are standing in the courtroom, we're, we're on trial, we're standing on trial for our crimes. We are standing before the judge, the judge of heaven and earth, God the Father. Those who believe Jesus is the Father, they make the big mistake, I'm going to say eternal mistake, because they remove Jesus Christ's role. They remove his role as being intercessor, as being the advocate, as being the way, the bridge, the the one who bridges the gap between us and God, the Father. So to believe that Jesus is the Father is basically you're saying you have a courthouse where you, where you, you're the defendant, standing before a judge, God the Father, and then you have a prosecutor, Satan the accuser, who is also present, but then you see the seat of the defense lawyer nowhere to be found. It's empty. The defense lawyer has all the evidence to not only prove your innocence, but free you, essentially. You might want to represent yourself, yeah. But in this case, you're guilty of the crime. And the proof is clear. It's irrefutable. You're guilty. And the verdict is death. The death sentence. So... The defense lawyer is not only the one defending you, but is putting themselves in your in your seat, essentially, taking on the death sentence so that not only can you be proven innocent, but you are free to live. So to wrap up, the question of, is it important that Jesus is not the Father? It is one of the most fundamental and important questions of our faith and our very existence. First of all, because the scripture cannot be broken, as Christ said, and it cannot contradict itself. It is infallible. It is perfect. Jesus was not called the everlasting father. Rather, he was identified correctly as uh, by the name of the messenger of great counsel, or more simply, the messenger of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Secondly, the misunderstanding of the word one or echad in Hebrew is more rightly interpreted using the scriptures as first or united. Thirdly, God the Son's role as the mediator for mankind to present himself before the judge, God the Father, and not only remove the criminal charges, are laid on us and that we deserve but the death sentence jesus christ himself restores the relationship that was initially broken in the garden of eden between god and man his and his children god the father and his children this is not a topic we can be confused about or get wrong because jesus christ is the only way to the father he said, no one can come to me except the Father draw, draw him to me. And the only, the only way to be saved and to enter into life in the millennium and after that in the eternal kingdom of God 
is through Jesus Christ. I'm going to finish with three scriptures. John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Daniel seven thirteen. I beheld, I beheld in the, in the night vision, and look, one coming with the clouds of heaven as the Son of Man. And he came on to the Ancient of Days and was brought near him. And lastly, Revelation 21, verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Thank you for your attention. I hope uh, that brings more clarity to this question. And with that, I bid you all Shabbat Shalom. Maranatha.